the world has known few conquerors like Alexander the Great. In just a few short years after rising to power, he laid claim to much of the known world, known to him and his people, that is. Alexander marched his armies across Greece, Persia, and even into India. But for all of the glorious and bloody military triumphs Alexander had led, he was still, like so many others, defeated by the mortality of his own body. Sit back, relax, and let me tell you a story while Rome burns. The year is 325 BCE. Alexander the Great has just won a decisive victory over King Porus at the Battle of the Jalem River. Alexander wanted to march further east to do battle with the armies of the Nanda Empire. This army was said to be five times the size of Alexander's remaining forces. The Battle of the Jalem River had cost Alexander's army quite a bit. Additionally, the men who had followed Alexander on his conquest had not been home in many years. They longed to see their families, their friends, their wives, and their children once more. Alexander pleaded with his army. The maps he was using, incorrectly recorded by the Greeks, showed that the world ended just a few thousand kilometers away. Alexander wished to march to the end of the world. His troops would have none of it, though. Deciding it was better to listen to the advice of his officers rather than face mutiny, Alexander bid farewell to the lands of India and ordered his men to return home. The return was no easy task for Alexander's army, however. First, Alexander ordered the subjugation and conquering of any Indian tribes encountered along the way. This included an attack on the Mali. During a siege of one of their cities, Alexander sustained an injury after foolishly jumping into the fray. His army, believing that their king had fallen, took to butchering the entire city, down to the last man, woman, and child. Alexander, however, was not killed in this attack, and instead was saved thanks to the skills of his personal surgeon. Still, the brutality and barbarism shown by the Macedonian army led to the surrender of the remaining Mali villages. Alexander also commissioned a fleet to explore the Persian Gulf. He divided his army a third time and sent this group directly back to Carmania, which is in modern-day southern Iran. Finally, the remaining men in his retinue were marched through the harsh southern deserts of modern-day Makran. Why Alexander chose this route, known to be a dangerous and inhospitable place, has been the subject of much scholarly debate. One story states that Alexander chose this route as a way to punish his army for refusing to continue the march into India. Another theory states that this was Alexander's own hubris and personal ambition on full display. This desert was reportedly the same desert that Cyrus the Great had failed to cross during his own campaigns. Regardless of the reason for Alexander's decision, his army suffered greatly in their travels through the desert back home. Starvation, dehydration, and disease were constant dangers faced by the men during this forced march. Alexander, never one to sit comfortably while his army suffered, shared in their misery, refusing water at times when his men would also have gone without. One story, likely a fabrication, states that a soldier approached Alexander, his helmet removed from his head and filled to the brim with water. Alexander looked on passively at the soldier and then accepted the helmet. With a word of thanks to the soldier, he then dumped the water on the ground in full view of his army. He would not have his thirst quenched while those around him suffered. 
the march carried on towards Susa. Accompanying Alexander the Great on his travels back to his kingdom was a philosopher, Hindu Brahmin, and gymnosophist known as Kalanos, who was one of several gymnosophists who met Alexander and impressed him with their thoughts, approvals, and critiques of Greek philosophy. Being an educated man, Alexander convinced Kalanos to accompany him on his travels. Kalanos agreed and set out back home with Alexander and his army. Eventually, the weather of Persia became too much for the 73-year-old Kalinos, and he was left weakened and debilitated. Kalinos did not wish to live out his remaining months or years debilitated and relying on the charity of others, so he informed Alexander of his intention to take his own life by self-immolation. Alexander, having grown fond of the man, begged him to reconsider, but found that he could do nothing to talk him out of it. When Alexander's army arrived in Susa in 323 BCE, Alexander ordered his general Ptolemy to construct Kalinos' pyre. With the pyre built, Kalinos bid farewell to Alexander with a chilling statement that has now taken on the mantle of prophecy. He laid down on the pyre, pointed at Alexander, and said, We shall meet in Babylon. This statement is seen as Kalinos foreseeing the death of Alexander that awaited him in Babylon. With that, the pyre was lit and the flames began to burn hot. It is said that Kalinos did not flinch or make any noise as the flames consumed his body. The thing that made many of Alexander's men, and even the great conqueror himself, curious was that at the time, Alexander had no intention of going to Babylon, but was rather directing his men back to Macedonia. The death of his lifelong friend, Hephaestion, in October of 324 BCE, had impacted Alexander the Great immensely. As they prepared to leave Susa in 323 BCE, Alexander ordered his men to march to Babylon, as he intended to hold funeral games in honor of his dearly departed friend. The army set out, and Alexander ordered his entire empire into a period of mourning. It is said that Alexander's grief over Hephaestion was paralleled only by that of Achilles over the death of his friend, Patroclus. Along the way to Babylon, Alexander's army encountered a group of Chaldeans who prophesied that a bad omen hung over Alexander should he enter the city from the east. The Chaldeans stated that their deity, Bel, had told them that to do so would be deadly for the young king. Alexander, always a superstitious person, decided to follow his advice and march his army around the city to enter through the royal gate of Babylon. The march around the city to accomplish this inadvertently took the army through swampy lands and rough terrain. The return to Babylon was both glorious and gloomy. Alexander put on the funeral games for Hephaestion and ordered a huge pyre constructed as Hephaestion's final resting place. The cost was extravagant, and it is said that nothing had been put on in Babylon before or since. After the period of mourning had passed, Alexander turned his attention to the pressing matter of further conquest. He had his eyes set on Arabia, perhaps with an eye of turning back to India after his army had rested up. It was said that he was in festive spirits and agreed to attend a party hosted by one of his close friends, Medius. The party involved heavy drinking, food, laughter, and music. Eventually, Alexander fell ill and retired for the evening, complaining of pain in his stomach. He developed a fever that left him bedridden for days, eventually leaving him unable to speak. 
Alexander's soldiers were reported to be anxious about the health of their king and were granted the right to file past Alexander and give him well wishes. As each soldier filed past, Alexander gave a weak wave to each of them, but otherwise could not acknowledge them. The illness ravaged his body and left him in agonizing pain until finally Alexander, king of Macedon, hegemon of the Hellenic League, pharaoh of Egypt, king of Persia, and lord of Asia, was dead. Many theories abound as to the actual cause of death for Alexander the Great. Whether it was a disease such as malaria or typhoid, or perhaps a conspiracy of assassination against the great warlord is a mystery that has captivated the scholars for centuries. A leader at the height of his career, with the entire world still available to him, cut down by the very weaknesses of the human body. Alexander's empire did not last much longer after he died. In the aftermath of the death of Alexander, each of his top generals began carving out territories and claiming lands and loyalties of local lords and armies. Following the death of Alexander, the Macedonian Empire fell into 40 years of civil war until finally four stable kingdoms remained. Ptolemaic Egypt, Seleucid Mesopotamia, Atalid Anatolia, and Antigonid Macedon. During these years, the remaining heirs to the throne of Macedon, Alexander IV and Philip III, were murdered. The final mystery surrounding Alexander the Great is his final resting place. First, his body was placed in a coffin filled with honey to preserve it during the time that his tomb was constructed in Memphis, Egypt. He was interred in this tomb until a later king of Ptolemaic Egypt had it moved to Alexandria. This resting place is the one purported to have been visited by Octavian during his capture of Egypt and Cleopatra during his war against Mark Antony. Octavian is said to have laid flowers on the tomb and placed a golden diadem on the head of Alexander the Great as a sign of honor. Unfortunately, the location of the tomb was eventually lost to history after the 4th century CE. There were rumors and stories of where the tomb may be, but its definitive location has been lost to history. The story of Alexander the Great is one that has captivated the minds of scholars, warlords, politicians, and storytellers for millennia. His death is a reminder that no matter how many accomplishments we may have to our name, no matter how many honors, titles, lands, or riches we have accumulated in life, those fortunes can change in an instant. Thank you for listening to our show. While Rome Burns is part of the One Up Podcast Network. Find more of our shows, including the award-nominated D&D podcast, Are We Dead Yet?, by going to oneuppodcasts.com. That's the number one, U-P-P-O-D-C-A-S-T-S dot com. Cover art by Igor Nunes. You can contact him for commissions on Twitter at WeCan. That's W-H-Y-C-C-A-N. Find more of his art by going to wecan.artstation.com. Background music provided by One Place Here under a Creative Commons Zero 1.0 Universal Public Domain dedication. Find them on Twitter at One Place Here Music or at freemusicarchive.org slash music slash One Place Here. That's M-O-N-P-L-A-I-S-I-R. Thank you so much for listening.